Now my Bible is open at Proverbs chapter 28. I'm reading only one verse of scripture here. I go to 1 John in the New Testament and read another verse or two. Page 692 in the original Schofield Refus Bible. We always keep a few of those Bibles on hand and save people around $10 on each Bible that like to get a Schofield Refus Bible, the original, not the new, but the original. Now in Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13, He that covets his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesses and forsakes them shall have mercy. That's Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13. He that covets his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesses and forsakes them shall have mercy. Now turn to 1 John chapter 1, will you please? I'm looking at verse 8 on page 1321 in the New Testament. Verse 8 down at the bottom said, If we say that we have no sin... We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we made him a liar and his word is not in us. So the Bible tells us here, if we'll confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Speaking on the subject, I have sinned. Three words. I'm going to mention seven people in the Bible that said those three words. I have sinned. I want to find out what they said or what they did. I don't th I think I've ever seen a man that, uh, that so uh, showed how sorry he was about his sins than I did uh, Jim swaggered whenever he fouled up when he showed him on TV squalling every once in a while they show him face to all the pieces and crying because he had sinned and he said I have sinned that's what he said he said I've sinned against God now if he was sincere and I think he was at that time God will forgive him but that doesn't uh, take care of the damage done he's lost half or more than half his ministry and will continue to lose like Oral Roberts. Oral Roberts told so many lies. He's lost about half of his ministry. And he's continued losing more. And these people, they say they have sinned. Anyone that says I have sinned, if they mean business, God will forgive them for their sins. But that doesn't mean the scars will be removed. It doesn't mean that the damage has been done or be taken care of necessarily. Uh, that price must be paid, although they'll be forgiven for their sins. We find some in the Bible that said, I've sinned and God forgave them. And God will forgive you. If you pray that prayer, it means business if you've sinned against God. Now the Bible talking about a sinner said, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's the sinner everybody has. And then when you get saved, occasionally some of God's people will fall into sin or do wrong. But if I'll ask God to forgive them, then God will forgive them. You must believe the Bible, believe in God, believe the book. I'm thinking about this liberal professor, infidel, standing before some students. And he said, how many of you students believe this Bible is the word of God? Only one stood up. He said, I believe that the Bible is the true and errant word of God. The old apostate professor said, I don't. said, I believe it's full of contradictions and question marks and errors. And said, I, I can't understand this book, the old professor said. The student said, well, sir, said the Bible was written as a letter to God's children. And said, your problem is you're reading somebody else's mail. Now, you won't ever understand the word of God if you're not saved. The natural man cannot understand the things of God. Neither can he know them. They're spiritually discerned. And no saved person can ever understand the spiritual things of the Bible. And so these people said, I have sinned. We want to talk about them. Number one, there is a hardened sin of Pharaoh. In Exodus chapter 9, verse 27, And Pharaoh sinned and called for Moses and Aaron and said unto them, I have sinned. 
I am the Lord is righteous, and I and my people are wrong. Now, when God sent the plagues, it sent six already, he sent plague number seven. And then uh, whenever plague number seven took place, Pharaoh said, I have sinned. Now he realized he's getting into trouble. And he said he'd sinned and I've been wrong. He said the people of Egypt have been wrong. Now Pharaoh didn't get right with God. He just uh, said he had sinned, he had done wrong. And he realized he didn't ask God to forgive him. But he said, I've sinned. And so he had a hardened heart and he kept hardening his heart against God and against the things of God. He made this statement because he was in danger. While in danger, he did so. Many times confessions made in a storm are forgotten when the sun is shining. You take a lot of people, they'll get all upset whenever it's stormy. But when the sun comes out, then they, uh, they, they make God some promises during the storm. And when the storm is over, they forget about those promises when the sun comes out. Now, if you make God some promises and ask God to forgive you for certain things during the stormy time, whenever the sun comes and clouds are gone, then you continue to stand by that promise. Now, Pharaoh was a hardened sinner, and he's a type of the devil, and he was holding God's people in bondage. And whenever God began to deal with him, he didn't like what was happening. He said, I've sinned. Secondly, there's a double-minded man by the name of Balaam. In Numbers chapter 22 and verse 34, and Balaam said unto the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. For I knew not that thou stoodest in the way against me. Now therefore, if it is pleased thee, I will get me back again. Now this man Balaam is quite interesting to read about him. He's mentioned uh, several times in the Bible, and I'm going to uh, touch briefly upon where he's na his name is mentioned and, and what it's all about. Now, the Moabite's people saw the people of Israel coming across the land that they had destroyed the Amorites, and they were afraid that they might be destroyed, and, and uh, Balak, there the ruler in Moab, sent for Balaam. Now, Balaam was a prophet of some kind, and he sent for him because he felt like Balaam could get something accomplished, and he was afraid of the Israelites, and he wanted to get Balaam to come and curse those Israelites. He sent some of his dignitaries and some of his wealth and promises, and he wanted him to come. Now the Bible speaks about the way of Balaam in Second Peter chapter two and verse fifteen. The way of Balaam is the howling prophet. That is, he's willing to pronounce a curse. He's willing to do what they want to do for the money he gets out of it. He's a howling prophet. He's willing to sell out and go ahead and do things that they want done for what he can get out of it. Now, I'm sorry to say today, you have many men today in the religious world that are howlings. They just are in it for what they can get out of it. And they wouldn't be willing to eat cornbread and drink stump water and preach the gospel. They wouldn't be willing to do that if they had to. Now, God's man that's called of God will preach the gospel if he gets nothing out of it. He'll preach. He'll do what he can as long as he lives to get the gospel out if he nobody gives him a dime. But you have highlands. They can be hide by the big shots, the politicians, the up and up crowd, and there they scratch the backs of people, tickle their ears, and they're in the ministry drawing their breath and their salary. They don't give a rip about the people, what happens to them, or whether or not they save the lost because they're unconcerned about that. Now, Balaam was a highland prophet. He was out for hire. He'd do whatever needed to be done in order to get a gift for it and, uh, and be praised for it. And so Simon Peter mentions him in Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 15. And then you have the error of Balaam in Jude 11. Now the error of Balaam is that he cursed the people of God. Now Balak wanted him to curse the people of God, the Israelites. And he was willing to go curse them. Now God told him not to because God said, you can't curse my people that's been blessed. And, but he was willing to go anyway. And he kept on and kept on until God said, go ahead and do whatever you want to. 
you're on your own. But he got into trouble. He ran into this donkey in the way that talked back to him and, and tried to keep him from going on and, and cursing the people of God. Of course, he couldn't curse them, but he thought he could. Now we find Jude mentioned that in Jude verse 11. And then you have the doctrine of Balaam in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 14. Now that's exactly what he did uh, for the Israelites. He, he, he preached his doctrine, uh, preached his doctrine uh, off on the Israelites. He encouraged his doctrine. And his doctrine was corruption. That is, when he saw he could not curse the people of God, then he offered a suggestion. He said, why can't the people, the Moabitish people, intermingle with the Israelites and marry uh, the Israelites and let the Israelites marry the Moabites and let's get all mixed up here in a, in a marriage among each other and then what they have will be ours and what we have be theirs and that way they won't destroy us. Now Balak liked that. He was afraid he might be destroyed by the Israelites and Balaam then preached that doctrine that was his doctrine. Let's corrupt them. Uh, we can't curse them. We can't stop them. Let's corrupt them. And so he set out then to corrupt the people of God. And, and of course he did it to a certain extent. And that's a doctrine of Balaam. Now that thing is happening today uh, among people. You have compromises today that's moving in the ecumenical field. Joining up with everything that comes along regardless of what they believe. And they think the ends are justify the means. But they're dead wrong. We're not to compromise and go along and with any kind of wind of doctrine that comes along, must believe this book and stand true. So you have the double-minded Balaam said, I have sinned. And then number three, you have the insincere man by the name of Saul. And 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 24, And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned. If I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord, and thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Saul was the king of Israel, and he sinned against God. God said, Saul, I want you to go down and destroy the Amalekites. I want you to kill all of them. Don't spare any of them. Don't spare anything down there. You go just warp out everything. And Saul went down, and instead of doing what God said do, he spared old King Agag, the king, and then he spared the best of the flock, the sheep and goats and whatnot, and brought them back with him. And on the way back, the old prophet Samuel met him. And Samuel said, uh, Saul, have you done what God told you to do? Yes. Uh, you've gone down and destroyed everything down there? Yes, sir. Well, he said, uh, what is that I hear down there? I hear some blading of sheep and cattle and goats and whatnot. And said, oh, where'd they come from? And Saul said, well, I'll tell you what, uh, Prophet Samuel. He said, we picked out some real clean animals down there, and we killed the rest of them. We brought these back. We're going to sacrifice them to God. And Samuel said, listen, listen, Saul. Obedience is better than sacrifice. God's not concerned about your little sacrifice. God is concerned about you doing what he told you to do. And God said for you to go down there and destroy everything down there that has breath. Don't leave a thing. Now here you come back, old King Agag, and here you come back with, with the lambs and the goats and the cattle disobeying God. And what did Saul say? And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned. For I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord in thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Saul said, I have sinned. I have feared the people. Now, he was God's leader, God's king. Now, a leader should fear no one, a king or a ruler. A preacher should fear no one. A preacher should not fear the people, his members, anybody else. He's not to be afraid if God's on his side. He's to preach that book whether they like it or not. He's to give them the word of God whether they want it or not. He's to preach the whole counsel of God and fear the face of no man. Anytime some preacher compromises, saw soaps and comes along and said, well, the reason I didn't preach it, I, I was kind of afraid of the people. There's a dear old black man one time. He preached about everything but stealing. And one of the deacons came up to him and said, Reverend, said, uh, 
Uh, said, you preach about everything you think of, but you don't preach against stealing. He said, why don't you preach against stealing? He said, well, when I preach against that, he said, it throws a coldness over the congregation. Well, now, whether or not it throws a coldness over the congregation or not, we're to preach it and let people know that we're to preach against sin regardless of what it is. Now, one day, uh, David was to send the throne and Saul tried to kill him. Uh, but God wouldn't let him touch David because uh, he was so jealous of David. And Saul said, you can't touch him. Uh, God said, rather, Saul, you can't touch him. And he feared the people. And so he said, I have sinned. Number four, we have the doubtful penitent Achan. And Joshua chapter 7 and verse 20, and Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel. And thus and thus have I done. Now we need to realize that, that there's people that can sin against God in direct disobedience and really get a, a, a problem, run into a problem by doing so. That's what Achan did. Now God said to Joshua, I want you to go in and take uh, Jericho. Now God had put a curse on everything in Jericho. And God had condemned Jericho, and Jericho was selected to be annihilated. And God said, now when you go in there, don't touch anything. Don't bother anything. Don't take anything out of Jericho. It's got a curse on it. They went into Jericho, and we find that Achan there saw something. He saw a Babylonian garment and wedge of gold and a wedge of silver. And he said, it'd be a shame me not to take this Babylonian garment, which is very valuable and very beautiful. He said, it'd be a shame for me not to take this silver and this gold and leave it here. And so he took it and he hid it. He saw it, he took it, and he hid it. Now the devil came to him and tempted him through all, through all channels, lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And so he took it and he hid it. And so whenever he did, he stalled the army of God. Because later, whenever Joshua said, go and take Ai, and just send a certain number of men, you don't need too many, the town is small, and they were defeated. Defeated the second time. And Saul, God said to, to Joshua, brother, Joshua, there's sin in the camp. There's sin in the camp. That's why you people are dying. There's sin in the camp. Find out what it is. They began to check out, and sure enough, it came to Achan's tent. Joshua said to Achan, said, uh, have you sinned against God? And he knew he was on the spot, and knew he had sinned against God. And there he said, yes, I have. I, he said, what have you done? He said, in Jericho, I took a Babylonian garment. I took a wedge of silver and a wedge of gold, and I have them hid here in my tent. Joshua said, too bad. You're going to have to pay with your life. And he took Achan and his entire family out there and stoned them to death. They all died because of that sin. But Achan said, I have sinned. That's a minister one time that kept a record of the names of thousands of people that made a deathbed profession that lived after they made a profession of faith on their deathbed. Thousands of them. Only three Continue to live for God after he got well. Now I believe in a deathbed repentance. And occasionally you have somebody. They'll get saved on their deathbed. But not many. Because if they got well. They'd go out and prove they wasn't right with God. So most of the deathbed repentance. And the easy believism. Doesn't do the job. The people die and go on to hell. But there's a few occasionally. That really mean business on their deathbed. And they get right with God. I won some to God on their deathbed. I believe was really saved. And so that happens occasionally. So Achan had to die because of that sin. Number five, we have the repentance of despaired Judas. In Matthew chapter 27 and verse 4, Judas, after he had betrayed the Lord and sold him for 30 pieces of silver, he said in Matthew chapter 27 and verse 4, I have sinned. I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what's that to us? See thou to that. Now, Judas Iscariot did not confess this to God. He didn't ask God to forgive him. He repented within himself. 
The Bible said he repented within himself. Now you can repent within yourself and you'll get nowhere. If you want forgiveness of your sins, you've got to repent to God. He's the one that takes care of the sin question. And Judas is cat repented within himself and said, I've sinned. Now what happened was he was sorry that he got caught in that terrible mess. He had sold the Lord and for 30 pieces of silver and realized the trouble and mess he'd got into. Judas was never saved. Oh, you say, preach Edwards, didn't Judas get saved? And then when he betrayed the Lord, got lost again. No, no, Judas was never saved. In John chapter 6, the last few verses in John chapter 6 will tell you that Judas was a devil from the very beginning. He was never a saved man. Not only that, Judas Iscariot went to his own place and he's coming back again, probably during the tribulation period uh, there to to uh, minister on the earth for evil and for the devil. But Judas was never, never a saved man. He said, I have sinned. Now, he didn't ask God to forgive him. He didn't repent toward God. He said, I have sinned. And he said that because the terrible mess he got into. I know people right now in jail or in prison. And uh, they uh, got sorry that they got caught and put in jail. And, and they repented. Repented that... And grieved over the fact that God called. They didn't repent toward God. Now I let them get out of jail. And they'll go do the same thing again. You can go through prison today. And where well, there's hundreds of prisoners. And most of them in there. Because they never committed the crime. They were sent there for. And that's what they tell you. But they're in there because of the crime they committed. Occasionally you might make a mistake. And put a man in there that, that didn't commit the crime. But over 99.5% of them are there because they committed the crime they committed, but they'll tell you that they didn't do it. And they say, we're sorry we got into this trap and this mess, and we're sorry about it. We, we're willing to go back and repay what we've done, and we're willing to change and, and do better if we can get out of here, but to never repent toward God. In order to get cleaned up, you must repent toward God. Repenting toward man is not going to solve your problem. Judas Iscariot repented toward himself. Sorry got caught. Sorry he's in that mess. No doubt right now there's somebody in jail listening to me right now. Without a doubt. Maybe hundreds of them. And you're sorry you got caught. You're sorry you did what you did. You got into that dope business and liquor business and stole and robbed and want to support your family and some committed murder. You got, you, you did all of that. Now you're sorry that you did that. Now the reason you're sorry is you got caught and you're in jail or in prison. That's what you're sorry about. You haven't asked God to forgive you and cleanse you from sin and meant business. So if you did get out, you'd live a good, genuine Christian life. No, you haven't, you haven't planned that at all. You're sorry you got caught, and when you get out, you probably do the same thing again. But a few people in prison repent toward God, and God forgives them. They become Christians, and when they get out, they serve God. They begin to witness for God there in the prison. A few of them, very few of them. Now Judas repented himself. Number six, you have the repentance of the saint Job. In Job chapter 7 and verse 20, I have sinned. What shall I do unto thee, O thou preserver of me? And why hast thou sent me as a mark against thee, so that I am a burden to myself? Job said, I have sinned. You say, preacher, what did Job do wrong? He had some pride in his heart, and that pride was sin. God hates pride. And he said, I have sinned. And he admitted that he had sinned and asked God to forgive him. If you read the last chapter of the book of Job, you'll find Job came out with twice as much as he had in the beginning. But he confessed that sin. And when he confessed that sin, then he prayed for his tormentors, those that came to criticize him. And God blessed him, gave him more than he had in the beginning. Number seven, that is a blessed confession of the prodigal son. And Luke chapter 15, verse 18, I will arise and go to my father. I will say to him, Father, I have sinned. I have sinned against heaven and before thee. Now, you know the story of the prodigal. That parable lets you know when he said, I have sinned. And he meant business. Then he went back home. He was forgiven. And ended in on a great jubilee. Had a wonderful time there in the father's house. But he had to first commit that he had sinned. 
Now you're going to get nowhere with God and nowhere in your testimony unless you repent toward God if you've sinned. You've got to ask God to forgive you. That brings you to our last text. If we confess our sins, thou art faithful and just forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That means the Christian. That's not talking about the sinner. God never asked a sinner to confess his sins. God told him repent and believe and God blot them out. But God said to the Christian, you got to confess your sins. Didn't say to the preacher, didn't say do it to the deacon, but do it to God. You confess your sins to God as a saved person. And God will cleanse you from all of your sins. God said he would. If we confess we have sinned, then God cleanses us from all unrighteousness. But you got to confess it. you got to admit it. Don't call it mistakes. Don't call it errors. Call it what it is. Call it sin. Man down at the altar one time and Mel Trotter was down praying with him and Mel told him, said, why don't you uh, confess your sin? Confess your worst sin. And the man said, I, I don't know what it is. He said, go ahead and confess one anyway. And he confessed the very one that was worst sin. He knew all the time what it was. And if you're sinned against God, you know what it is. No one has to tell you. You know what that sin is. And you must ask God to forgive you. I'm going to give you some information here that I took from uh, the the Bread, you know, like the, we get from Dihon. And I want you to listen to this, and I close. God has chosen the weak things to put to shame the things which are mighty. That's 1 Corinthians 1, 27. During a Billy Sunday evangelistic campaign, a mentally impaired boy came faithfully each night to sing in the choir. Joy was not very bright, said Homer Rodeheva. Homer Rodeheva was the director the well-known song leader for Billy Sunday. But he never missed any of our meetings and wouldn't leave until he shook my hand. Sometimes I was embarrassed by the way he constantly uh, tell me and I secretly wished he'd go away. Then one evening a man came to Rodeheber and said, thank you for being kind to my boy Joey. He's not right mentally, but never has he enjoyed anything so much as singing in your choir. He worked hard doing, uh, he worked hard doing simple chores for people so he could contribute to the collection. Through his pleading, my wife and five other children came to the evangelistic campaign and have now received Christ. Last night, his 75 year old grandfather, who had been an atheist all his life, was saved. Tonight, his grandmother also came forward. Now our entire family is converted. Joy was one of God's Faithful servants. See, they didn't think he had good sense. But that man is doing a job for God, that boy. And Rodeheaver became a little ashamed of him because he trailed him around and there every night in the choir. And mine wasn't bright. And, and uh, so after he found out what it was all about and what the score was, he had to repent. Ask God to forgive him and feeling that way toward that mentally retarded boy. That boy's been used of God and used greatly for God. So people that uh, that's being used of God, we need to be careful about criticizing. God chooses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. They all said, I have sinned. Let's stand up. Our Father, I pray today you'll take the message and use it. For some of your children here that they have sinned against thee, may they be willing to confess it to you today and be cleansed and washed anew by the precious blood. For somebody here looking for a church home and want to join Northside and move upon their hearts, somebody backslid, maybe want to come back, pray they'll come forward. If somebody here that needs to be saved, may they do likewise and have you in the invitation for Jesus' sake. Amen. Debbie is going to play for us. Now listen to me. If you're unsaved, or you're backslidden, or you've sinned against God, and you want to ask God to forgive you, you don't have to confess it to me or anybody else. Just come down and tell God about it. He's the one to confess it to. And while she plays, if God speaks, would you come? <laughs> God is speaking, would you come? 